All right, thank you so much. I'd like to go ahead and pass the mic back to Arielle Kennan, who will be introducing our final speaker of this morning. Arielle. Hello again, everybody. Um, thank you to our amazing lightning talk speakers. Um, I get to work with all of those wonderful humans uh, pretty regularly, and even I learn stuff in their talks. So thank you all again so much. Um, for this next session, we are going to be taking questions again from our in-person audience. Um, so if you still have a note card, if you need a note card, you can also put up your hand and we can get those to you. Um, but I please hope you will have questions um, for our next guest. Um, and so we'll remind you as we go. Once again, that'll be a hold a card up and pass it to the end to bring it down the aisle. Um, so we are so lucky um, to have Jennifer Palka joining us. Um, her new book, Recoding America, was released just yesterday. Um, if you don't believe me that it's a good read, um, Ezra Klein last week called it the book that every policymaker needs to read. Um, and I can't think of a better endorsement um, for the book or a reason to read it. If you don't know Jen already, um, she's the founder of Code for America. She was a deputy CTO in the Obama administration, and she's also the co-founder of U.S. Digital Response. Um, I have been so lucky to call Jen a boss, a mentor, a friend over the last decade or so. Um, and she's also um, much who I thank um, for letting me know that I could use my skills um, in design and product development um, in the public sector. So le please, let's give Jennifer Palka a warm welcome. Thank you, dear. Oh, oh excellent. Thank you. Uh, what a delight to be here. This is like best place ever to be the day after you launch a book with people who do all the work that you care about and uh, the work that you are, I'm, I happen to be just so in awe of. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, let's see, let do that. Okay, those are Pam's. Go back. Ah, the other one. Gotcha. Now, I know, I know how to use technology. It's good. I'm really great at it. Um, uh, I was recently in the UK where I was talking with a friend who's an economist who kept saying, we starve government by design. It's always by design. We don't give government the resources that it needs. And I think that she's right often, but when she says that, I think about our relationship to design and I think about all the people who tell me when they see an application form for benefits, that isn't easy to use, that somebody has designed that to be hard to use, that it's intentionally user hostile. And I'm not sure that's exactly the correct uh, characterization of our relationship with design in benefits. And so I just wanna do a little exploration of that with you and test some ideas about really what it is it that we need from design uh, are we starving ourselves by design or what are we really starving ourselves of? Um, so I'm going to start with some work that I did over the pandemic with California when the uh, EDD, the Employment Development Department, ended up with a very large backlog of claims. Every state, as you know, had a backlog of claims because we had somewhere between 10 and 30 times the applications that had to have, that we were getting before the pandemic started. And Gavin Newsom, who's our wonderful governor, asked us, uh, uh, me and Yolanda Richardson, to co-chair a strike team to see if we could help the, get those, uh, those claims cleared. And uh, this was an incredible learning experience for me, even though I felt like I knew a little bit about uh, how benefit stuff worked. Um, of course, the thing everybody thought was wrong was COBOL. That's what they all say. There's COBOL in the systems, and that's why this doesn't work. Um, I think we all know that is not a sufficient explanation for why we get backlogs and benefits claims. And of course, it's not even really all that true. Uh, there was a mainframe system that was developed in the 80s. But for the decades after that mainframe, we had layered on all sorts of layers of technology, sort of about one a decade. So we really didn't have a COBOL system. And I think this is true probably in all of the states, 
we had these archaeological layers of technology that had accumulated since we started processing these things electronically. Um, and it had been very hard to go back over time. So Tony Scott calls these the layers of paint. You all know if you, you, know, you paint your windowsill too many times, it starts to crack. And these, of course, had started to crack. But they're also, I think it's important because when you, when you paint a windowsill, you're doing it intentionally. I liked this archeological layers metaphor because it's just sort of what happened over time. They sort of just accrued these layers and it was very hard to go back and figure out how to make them work together. So we had systems, as you all know, that were complex and fragile. And that is a problem, but I learned why that is not really the biggest problem. And I learned that in, uh, from my friend Marina Nitza, who was working with the claims processors day after day. And one of them kept saying to her, I'm the new guy, I'm not quite sure know how to answer that question. Let me check with the other guys, I'm the new guy. And she finally said, well, how long have you been here? And he said, I've been here 17 years. The folks who really know how this works have been here at least 25 years. Uh, are we really gonna be able to just update the technology of a system that is so complex in its policy and processes and regulations? It's much more of a challenge, I think, of policy than it is really of just the technology. And of course, that policy was changing even as we were trying to clear the backlog. I, oh, I've gone the wrong way. Sorry, that's what I was doing. Um, so you had, you know, sort of the original law that governs this starting in 1935 with the Social Security Act. I don't know what to put in all those dots there, but many, many changes over time coming from uh, legislative, executive, and judicial branches from both federal and state government that make this very complex right up to the current day where the policy governing uh, unemployment insurance was changing because of COVID. There were, and also the clarity about the guidance of that policy was not always happening in exactly when we needed it to do. It was a very complicated situation. Um, this is uh, Commissioner Rob Asaro Angelo of New Jersey, Labor Commissioner, who testified with 7,119 pages of regulations in front of him because as they were dealing with their backlog, he needed people to understand how this was making this incredibly difficult to do. Um, so to all the folks who tell me that these systems are designed to be hard to use, I say, well, who designed them that way? Who are we supposed to blame? Is it the people who made the technology? Is it the people who made the forms? Or is it the people who, since 1935, have been piling on policy and regulation that make this incredibly difficult? Um, so is this really intentional design or are we letting things accrete and accrue over time in ways that are not serving us? I want to talk an about another example of why I sort of question this idea of intentionally user hostile design. Um, and many of you have seen this before. This goes all the way back to, I think we started talking about it in 2013. This is the application that 23 counties in California used to use for people to apply for SNAP. Um, and it had some problems. It, it took a very long time to fill out. There were over 200 questions. It didn't work on a mobile phone. It was very hard to upload your documents. And while I was working at Code for America, uh, a team, and I think one of the members of the team is here, but I don't see him, Dave Guarino. Okay, there he is. Um, decided that we could do better or California could do better and designed Get CalFresh to work on a mobile phone, to have text message follow-up, uh, to allow people to take a picture of the driver's license and uh, upload it as they were creating their application. Uh, and uh, there's a long story about how this sort of became in the end, the way that California had people apply for SNAP. And I'll talk about how, where that's gone in a second. Um, but one of the things that I learned through this was that uh, Dave's colleague, Jake Solomon, was asked to attend a meeting of that consortium of 23 counties who were responsible for, for building and using this system. 
And uh, he was asked because he'd been quite critical of it. He, uh, I guess he and Dave and others had created this teardown of it where they went through every screen and said, here it's hard for users, here it's hard for users. So you would think he would not be asked to join this meeting of the consortium, but he was asked in fact by the vendor, it was HP. And it turns out the vendor really wanted the consortium to make My Benefits Calwin work on a mobile phone. And Jake's critique, and both in his ability to articulate the user experience, why people needed it to work on a mobile phone was very compelling. And of course, to the credit of these 23 county representatives, they did decide to move this to, to, to use some of HP's resources that year to make this work on a mobile phone. But the interesting thing to me was not that they said yes, but how they said yes. And what they did is they all voted. The 23 representatives of the county all got to vote and I'm very glad that it, the vote came out right. But what was interesting to Jake as he came out of this meeting is that's not how they made decisions about Get Cal Fresh. They made it based on user research and watching users. And I think people from the outside don't understand when they see something that feels burdensome, that has 212 questions, they think there's some nameless, faceless bureaucrat behind this who's trying to make it hard for me. And they have too much power. And in fact, 23 county representatives each have very little power. All they're trying to do is to be able to get their needs of their county represented in this process, which makes sense. But who is there saying this is going to be what actually works for the users? And I think we sometimes, and so I, I talk a lot about this distinction between government needs and user needs, which is language that I borrowed from our friends at the Government Digital Service in the UK. And I think one of the points to take away from this is who in the room is clearly 100% first job representing your user needs. But the other thing is, are we really actively designing this or are we letting it be designed by committee? And do the people on the outside understand that it is actually not concentrated power that results in a 212 question form, but very diffuse power where nobody has the power to say, no, we're gonna take some of these questions out. That's gonna be better for the user. Um, my, uh, let's see, where do I have next here? Oh, this right. I wanted to update because of course now California does have a new application that's not Get Cal Fresh. It's called Benefits Cal. I don't want to uh, assume that just because it has a nice front page that it is well-designed all the way throughout, but I think that I hear good things about this application and we've really come a long way. So credit to the folks in California for, for taking this in a new direction. Um, I want to talk a little bit about an example that's um, not so much designed by committee and forgive me all the lawyers in the crowd, but designed by lawyers. <laughs> um, for my book, I interviewed a team that worked at CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So I guess I don't need to define that acronym for this crowd. I'm just so used to doing it. Um, who after the difficulties, shall we say, of healthcare.gov, were handed the job of implementing the next law, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act. Um, and they had, they knew that they couldn't have what happened happen before. They had to get it right this time. And they knew, because this had to do not with the general public, but with doctors, that doctors were already quite frustrated with them. They didn't like how they were supposed to put in their data about their outcomes, their billing data. They felt like it was sort of a black hole. I heard them say, you know, I'd upload the stuff, I'd hit submit. I had no idea if I'd done it right. If I did it wrong, it was going to deeply affect my practice. Um, and, they were, and they had to train people to use these systems that were really non-intuitive. And so when MACRA was announced or when it was passed by Congress, they started to grok the implications of it. Doctors said, oh my God, not only do I hate how I have to do this now, but they're gonna change it and I'm gonna hate it again. And the only thing worse than what we have now is having to learn a whole new system. And they started to say that they were gonna leave Medicare and not take Medicare patients. In fact, there were surveys that showed that many of them were actually planning to do that. So the team at CMS said, we have to make something that's gonna make sense to these doctors. And of course that meant good design and good programming, but it, I think what that design choices really meant is what I want to get at here. So I'm sorry, yes, the, the physicians were trying to, to leave Medicare. They were very, very frustrated. This one says, you know, the only uh, 
the, the only choice I have is to just get out. Um, so one of the first things that uh, the team implementing this had to do was just make a basic website that explained to people, here's what it's gonna look like, here's what's in the law, uh, before they put up the new system that doctors would use to file their data. And they found immediately that the first question doctors were gonna need to know was were they part, or they were gonna need to tell Medicare was, are you an individual sole practitioner? Or are you part of a group? I said, great, let's put that up. Well, it turns out there are nine different definitions of a group. So right from the beginning, everyone was gonna be really, really confused. And the team that had to do the implementation said to the policymakers, this isn't gonna work. We need to get this down to one definition of a group so that doctors aren't going to be so frustrated from the minute they start that they're leaving Medicare. They didn't get it down to one, they got it to two, but that's still pretty great. Uh, but that took a lot of work and a lot of people who were supposed to be technologists and in implementation talking with people who were in policy and having a dialogue with them and explaining to them why this was so important. And it's talking to, frankly, uh, a lot of lawyers who said, well, this is technically co legally correct. There are nine different definitions. They didn't make it up. It really was. But there was enough in common with many of those definitions they, that they could condense it down to two. Um, this is not where these fights ended. With the next one came up uh, was that some doctors who had very few Medicare patients could um, didn't actually have to participate in the program at all. They didn't have to get new EHR software. They didn't have to retrain their staff because they only had so many and the law exempted them. But the way the folks in, who were writing the regulations to, uh, sort of interpreted this was that all doctors would go through the program on the first year. And after the end of the first year, those who fell under the threshold would be exempted. So imagine you're a doctor who you think is, you know, you're, you don't think you're going to end up being and having to be in this program, but you have to train the staff and learn all this new software only then at the end of the year to be able to go back to what you were doing. And so um, a woman at, who's a career civil servant at CMS named Yadira Sanchez picked up this fight and uh, convinced ultimately after many, many conversations with the team writing the regs to let her let them exempt them based on the prior year's data. Less technically accurate, but better for users. And once again, she was acting outside of her lane. Is this really design? Or when we just say, let's, we'll have nine different definitions, when we say, let them, uh, let them go through the program, or are we letting lawyers, and we love lawyers, but are we letting lawyers do the job of design? Um, you know, I looked up when I was writing this talk, just, well, what's the opposite of design? And it, lots of different options, but the one that made the most sense is chaos, a lack of planning or organization. And I guess I would ask you all, do you think we have a lack of planning or organization in this field? You know, when you have procurement processes that look like this, you're doing a lot of planning and you have to be incredibly organized. The people I know in this field have organization skills far beyond most people that I know work in the private sector, because you have to be. I don't think that the opposite of this is a lack of planning, certainly amongst this, uh, this, or, uh, this crew. But what we have, are, because we have processes that complex, we have enormous lift on project managers. And project management is incredibly important. We should all worship the best project managers. But project management is the art of getting things done. And it stands in some, it, 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 its complement is product management, which is the art of deciding what to do in the first place. And if we don't have product management alongside project management, then your project managers are handing way too much and they're trying to do absolutely everything instead of doing what is most important to get to the right outcome and help our users. And I think product management and design are very closely related. Let's see what we have next. So from these stories, I just questioned my friend who kept saying that we are starving government by design. And I know I'm speaking about this at a moment where many states, particularly in unemployment insurance, have just been starved. They had been promised some money for modernization and it has now been taken away. And that happens a lot. And we starve programs like EITC 
of resources. But we also are putting a lot of money into the administration of many of our programs. And there are times when we are not starving it by design, but we are starving government of design. And design can be the thing that unlocks the use of those resources in the ways that I think that we all intend. Um, are we, it is also sometimes true that we don't value government, so we don't invest in it. But if we don't value design, we are not, our investments aren't paying off in the way that they should. And my illustration of that is a story that I will return to the California EDD during the pandemic. I explained to you how we found that you had to be there 17 years to even be sort of a newbie claims processor. Well, there was an impact to that that um, was really shocking. Let me go, oops, sorry. Um, we had this limited number of claims processors during a time when we had at least 10 times the number of claims we'd had in the past. So the governor and the legislature had all agreed that the thing we needed to do was get more people in to help. But what they didn't realize is that if it takes 25 years to become a claims processor, those people could not help with that at all. And what they did do is they took the time of those claims processors and they were slowing them down. And by the time we got their productivity, at a time when we needed their claims processors productivity to go way up, their productivity had dropped dramatically because they were answering emails from and onboarding and giving system access to 5,000 temps who could not help. Every person the state hired slowed our processing. Now there were other things that we did as well, but convincing finally the state to reassign those people to things like opening the mail uh, was one of the three things that unlocked our ability to clear that backlog. Mike Bloomberg said this recently, the capacity to do something gets conflated with the budget to do something. We had plenty of budget, but we didn't have the capacity. And we didn't have the capacity because of the complexity of the regulations and laws and policy and process that sat at top of it. I'm gonna skip that one real quickly. Um, so let me return again now to the team at Medicare that worked on MACRA. They were, and eventually rolled out a program called QPP, the Quality Payment Program. And because they made these choices, these choices about the policy and the regulations, not just the choices about the design and the application, like saying we're going to exempt people the first year, they actually rolled out the best uh, program that, that Medicare had ever seen. Doctors, they, they braced the call centers for the complaint calls on the first day. And instead, doctors called and said, something must be wrong. This is too easy. Uh, and they shipped on time and under budget. There's a woman who worked there, Yadira Sanchez, a career public servant, who sort of took what she learned by working on that team. What's the next thing that came her way? Oh, I'm sorry. Have I gone the wrong way? Ah, I think I have told her other story. Let me just jump ahead. Um, the next thing that came her way was a pretty small regulation that uh, Congress passed down that asked her to get data about pharmaceutical uh, you know, med medications and things out to the ecosystem. And in the regulation, it said very specifically, you will do quarterly data extracts and you will put them out there for the ecosystem to use. And she said, wait a second, if we do that, then it's gonna take nine months for us to package up each of those data extracts. There's gonna be tons of staff time on it. People aren't gonna get it till it's much later and they're only ever getting one slice of the data at one particular time. There's a better way to do this. We could write an API that allows uh, anybody to plug in at any time and have real-time access to the data. It's gonna cost a little bit more upfront, but it will cost much less over time. All we have to do is maintain the API and it's gonna get the outcome that Congress actually intended. And that's a very bold thing to do, to say, I hear what you told me to do, but I'm going to do this other thing over here because I think that's what you actually wanted. And that kind of boldness and ability to say, I know that's not what I was asked to do, but I think that this is the right thing to do is something that we don't lift up enough. And I think it's something that gets questioned a lot. But in the end, I see that as a design decision. 
It's product management saying, wait a minute, let's decide first if this is actually the right thing to do. So I want to end not just with the story of Yadira being quite bold, and I hope Yadira doesn't get any trouble for this after the book comes out, um, but also just by reminding you that when we do this work, we do it because we're doing it for people. And there's a saying in software that's been around a long time. I didn't make it up. Software is made by and for people. And of course, there's something else that's made by and for people, and that's government is made by and for people. Design is made by and for people. And when we do this work, I want us to remember not only the people that we're trying to do the work for, like having somebody in the room when everyone's voting who's saying, I'm actually representing the user experience here, but also the people here in this community that help us do that. We cannot do this alone. In fact, the, my one concern about having, I, I, I took this photo of Yudira off of her LinkedIn page because I'm afraid to ask her for a photo because I've put her in this book that I've read, uh, that I've written, and she's very nervous about it because she doesn't want to be seen as a hero because she always deflects towards her team and her community. And she always says, I didn't do this, we did this. And if we want to make decisions as bold as the one Yadira made, we have to do them together, not just in our teams, in our agencies, and in our states, but as a community that supports each other doing them. Oh, sorry, let me go back. Um, so I just wanted to say, to conclude, that uh, I released a book yesterday, and when Ariel said, oh, maybe the timing isn't good for this event, because your book will just come out and you may have things you need to do. I said, there is no better place for me to spend the day that my, well, sorry, the day after that my book comes out than with the people that I think are my heroes. And this has been an honor to talk to you about it. It's an honor that Ariel has arranged for everyone to get the book. Um, but thank you for letting me be part of your community, even though I'm not somebody who does the work on a day-to-day -day basis. And thank you for all the work you do. Please support each other through community. That's how we will do, make the de hard design choices that we need to make to get the outcomes that we intend. And it's, I was right on time. You were perfectly timed. I never get the timing right. This is great. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for our friend Jen? Can I see any cards go up? You can pass any other cards to the end, and then we'll clap them and bring them down. Kevin was in the front seat, so examples are. Hi, Kevin. Well done. All right, Jen, how can we build a coalition of leaders working to transform the culture of our government institutions? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're presenting a position that's in the minority of a lot of leaders that are out there. So yeah, yeah. you take what you're doing, amplify it, and and try to get try to try to get this to more people that are that are in those product manager roles or could be in those product manager roles or in leading organizations. I mean, I think that one of the reasons I wrote the book is that I feel like. Everybody I know in this field is sort of fighting that over and over again, fighting the sense that we are in the minority, that we have so many other people that we have to convince. And I think we need more people around this community willing to fight a little bit like up the chain on, be on your behalf. Um, so telling stories, uh, I like telling stories. I like writing, I like talking, and I'm happy to do that in hopefully in ways that change the environment that allow you to create these these coalitions of leaders. Um, but ultimately, um, I think it comes back to who are the leaders in this room and in other rooms? How are you connecting? How are you sharing your stories? Um, and you know, how are you supporting each other? And then what stories do you have that you can feed people like me and the press? One thing I really want elected leaders to take away from the book is that they spend all of their time on failure. And uh, there's a quote, I think it's Deepak Chopra says, what we pay attention to grows. Um, if they spent half of the time they spend calling people up in front of hearings and yelling at them as they did with the leader at the EDD while I was there and spent that instead saying, 
these folks are doing this right. Yadira is doing this right. You've got it right. You've got it right. What does that right look like? And how do we lift those stories up so that you can connect with each other? I think we would have far better outcomes. I'm just trying to acknowledge, I know that isn't necessarily in the power of everybody in this room, but we need to always be asking for our allies outside to help that get that message through to the people who can change the environment in which we work. Well, we have uh, an additional question. I agree that it makes sense to do the right thing rather than follow the precise but unhelpful letter of the law. <laughs> but <laughs> I worry about when harmful or misguided yeah. things can uh, be done under that banner. Do you have a thoughts? Do you have thoughts about how to square that circle? Yes. Um, whose question is this? Yeah, I think it's it's a really good question. It's really important to acknowledge. Um, uh, I think we will always be in tension between an agile government and a stable government. And that there is no solution to that, as they say. This is not a solution uh, to be, it's not a problem to be solved. It's a, it's a uh, situation to manage, right? And it's absolutely true that if we go too far to the other side and say, oh, you can ignore the law, just do whatever you want. We don't have a democracy anymore. And there have been threats to that in many ways that could brought that to, to life and, and, and made more scary, I think, in the past couple of years. Um, on the other hand, it is a balance and we need to ask ourselves where we are in that balance. Um, I, I don't know if anybody here does yoga, but like tree pose, it's not, a, it's not because <laughs> you are simply balanced, it is that you are constantly falling out of balance and falling back into it. That's how they say you stay up. I'm actually pretty good at tree pose. I'm terrible at the rest of yoga. You're, you're making me nervous in those shoes. I know, I make pose. myself nervous. Um, but we have gone, I think, in some ways too far towards follow the exact letter of the law. There's a fantastic um, law article by Nick Bagley called The Procedure Fetish, which speaks to why do we create procedure after procedure after procedure that stop letting us get the outcome that we need. And he has a couple of reasons, but the one that stuck with me is we have anxiety about legitimacy. We're afraid that if we don't have that procedure to say, I know I did it right because I followed this procedure, that somehow um, we aren't legitimate. We haven't made the right choice. And, and that's, a, that's a mind frame that I think does need to shift over. Do we risk creating a situation where there is disrespect for the law? Um, and civil servants who do things that are not what we decided to do democratically. Yeah, and that's always going to be a risk. But when we create a government that is so burdensome that people are incredibly frustrated, then you get disengagement from government, people who uh, experience burdensome means-tested benefits vote at lower rates. You get people who just say, this doesn't work, blow it all up. I don't care anymore. I don't, I can, I want to always both empathize with that feeling of want to blow it all up and remind ourselves there are better choices. Is that it? I think we have, we have time for another couple questions. So I have one in my hand, but if there are others in the audience, okay, I see one, <laughs> hold it up high and a runner will come and grab it from you. This is a question specific um, about the EDD work in California. How did the EDT team identify the people who used the UI system in order to provide feedback in a UX context? How do I identify people for feedback or user research? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it turns out there were actually a couple of teams already at the EDD that were doing user research. They just weren't talk, they weren't connected to the people who were trying to solve the problem. And I think you can probably ask Dave about this later because he was there as well. Um, uh, there were a lot of feedback about the user experience was coming in primarily in my, where, the seat where I sat from state, legislators whose offices were overwhelmed with phone calls. Um, there was a extensive Facebook group um, that had, I mean, extensive is not even the word for it, um, of people helping each other get through this process. Um, the truth is in terms of like finding the right users to do the research with, 
Um, I don't know how they were doing it, but they, I, I, I do know that they had a team already doing that, that again, great civil servants, the right practices, the right intentions, not connected to the people who are making the decisions. And just getting those dots connected, I think has, has helped a lot. Well, that last call got us, we got some good ones. So I think, we're, oh, do we have time? I think we're gonna do them. We're gonna go, okay, let's we're go. gonna go fast, okay. Love how you point out how design by committee can lead to a clunky user experience. What are your suggestions for rallying diverse stakeholders around a vision that will actually help users? Um, it, there's no silver bullet. <laughs> um, I think constantly returning to the goal and remembering that because you've said it once or you've gotten initial buy-in on it, you do not have final buy-in on it. <laughs> Remembering that it's a muscle that you build, not a thing you do. Um, uh, coming back again to the, finding a way to center the experience of the user for folks who are not gonna spend every day doing that, that's just not their jobs, but bringing it back and bringing it back. Um, it's a, it's, I will say it's a great question. And I think a lot of the people in the audience will have better tactical suggestions than I will. So why don't we have that be part of the lunch talk? Ask your ask your colleague you're sitting next to how they do it, because it's hard. I love it. Um, well, we're going to combine the last two questions because they're actually related to each other. Um, so can you please share some wisdom on storytelling in government for this work? Or do you have any fails, learns, or experiences? And the other question is around creating an elevator pitch for your top executive level, like a governor or mayor um, around this work. Um, I'll start with the second one. Um, I have an op-ed in the Washington Post today, actually, about this, which is, I think the key thing that um, a governor misunderstands right now is they'll say to me, you're right, this is all bad because we didn't invest in technology. And I'll say, no, you didn't invest in tech teams. You didn't invest in delivery teams. You didn't invest in design teams. You invest in people first and technology second. And I feel like that's the kind of thing that I can say 20 times before it gets through. Uh, but let's just say it 20 times because maybe they'll get it on the 21st. Um, <laughs> But uh, that op-ed is actually focused on the, do we have anybody from New Jersey's Department of Labor? Uh, you guys do some good work. <laughs> oh, is that Jillian? You know, you're in it, right? Okay. <laughs> um, there are many things that New Jersey is doing right in unemployment insurance. Um, and an op-ed only gives you 800 words. So the thing that I pulled out are leadership and investment in people. Uh, and I think that gets back to what I was talking about earlier. Um, many of you in UI ha may have just lost funding that you thought you were going to get. Um, that is not okay. I'm not condoning that. Uh, and I don't wanna celebrate it, but I do want everyone to go look at models like New Jersey, where they're gonna be able to keep making progress and making the experience for claimants in New Jersey a little bit better every day, every week, every month, because they've got teams with the right mandate working on it. Um, I know we don't all have that. <laughs> and that's what we need to tell our the, the people above, that's what you need to do. Thank you very much for the you know billion dollars that you are going to uh, you know, spend on something, but are we spending that well? And I, I don't know if there's anyone from California UI here. Um, there, you know, they, they, I live in California, so I watch this stuff. Um, there's there are RFPs that on, I think they're out on the street now that total $1.1 $1 billion for, and this is state money, it's not feds. So the cuts, I don't think help them. I appreciate that because I understand that we neglect these systems and downturns. And it's a, it's a way of saying, hey, we're not just going to like, now that the crisis is over, we're not just going to let it go. But I worry that that $1.1 billion is spending money on tech before it's getting the internal competencies and capacities and authorities right. And so 
um, I am eager to have people understand why New Jersey is doing such great work. But in the end, it is great leadership. Thank you, Jillian. <laughs> Um, I think I only answered one of them. What was the other one? Do you want to take on the the why? This is an oh, storytelling around procurement um, or the storytelling. I think you kind of covered them. Okay. Um, an elevator pitch. Oh, on procurement. Yeah. I, I, I will just be honest. I don't know what the solutions are for procurement. Everyone always says, what would you do if you had a magic wand on procurement? And I just say, I don't know. So um, uh, I tend to focus if I have a magic wand on can you hire people? Can you hire people in less than nine months? Do you have the people you need? Let's go back to people. That is the fundamental uh, uh, core thing that drives civil service, drives a healthy bureaucracy that can deliver on the intentions uh, of our policies and laws. So I'm just going to keep going back to that. Not that there's not a lot to say about procurement, but I think we should fix hiring first. <laughs> All right, Jen, thank you so much thank you. for sharing so generously with us today. I hope you can all give Jen a warm round of applause.